Just a um, quick kind of disclaimer. I've given this talk uh, a lot of times. I do give this talk to the med, med, uh, first year med students at Midwestern University. So it's about 250 med students during their first year. They get a two to three, it's, this year it was two years, it's usually a three hour lecture on LGBT health. And so we've shrunk that three hour lecture into half hour. So we're gonna, we're gonna cruise through some parts and feel free to stop us, uh, stop me I should say, if you have questions or clarifications or comments. And hopefully it can be more of a discussion rather than a lecture. Um, the last thing, disclosure, I'm not LGB or T. Um, but my brother's gay, he came out to me like 14 years ago um, when I was in med school. And so that kind of changed my interest in what I was looking at because, um, you know, I saw a lot of different needs and health in inequalities in the LGBT population that I felt I wanted to learn more about and be a part of um, giving better care to LGBT people. Let's see, where do I point it? Is it the arrow? Oh, there. Okay, there we go. All right, back up. So why are there programs for LGBT people? Uh, the government, every 10 years, produces this document. It's called Healthy People. Um, and they basically look in advance, in 10, 12 years, what areas do we want to be improved in our country uh, in terms of health outcomes? So. When Healthy People 2020 was created, they basically outlined about 42 groups of patients or patient uh, conditions that, we, that the government wanted to see improve. And one of those was LGBT people. They wanted to see better health outcomes, less health disparities among LGBT patients. And so you can find the, this uh, document, it's online, very easy to find. Um, and so this is basically a mandate from the government that we need to do better in our country at giving care to LGBT people. So in part of that was looking at the evidence behind why LGBT people have different health outcomes than non-LGBT people. And a lot of it has to do with the stigma and discrimination surrounding um, what those, that patient population can potentially fill. Um, and we'll talk about some of those outcomes and how they are related to uh, a lot to stigma and discrimination. So in a lot of this stigma and discrimination uh, surrounding health um, can come from different sources. Um, from institutions, structures, governments, employers, communities, families, um, neighbors, roommates, a lot of the, there's, there's really no way to say this is where the stigma arises from. It's kind of multifactorial. And um, all of those can lead to poor health outcomes. So here's some of the data that we're talking about. LGB people who experienced a prejudice related stressful life event like being fired from a job or um, assault, were three times more likely than those who did not to suffer a serious physical health problem over the next year. Uh, exposure to discrimination was related to a number of sick days, uh, increased number of sick days and number of physician visits when looking at gay bisexual men. Internalized homophobia, discrimination, expectations of being rejected were associated with an increased risk for HIV, uh, high-risk HIV behavior. And really it's been identified that these health uh, inequalities don't just happen to the middle-aged or the young or the elderly. It's kind of throughout, throughout the course of the life of an LGBT person, starting with childhood and adolescence, um, you know, uh, pediatric visits, uh, to kids, you know, who this, we, we start addressing these things early on in well visits and, and are sensitive and need to be sensitive to these uh, issues early on, middle adulthood and later in life. You know, one of the areas that I think still has a lot of work to be done is providing better care and resources to the elder, elderly LGBT community <laughs> who didn't um, maybe experience a lot of the, the acceptance that, you know, some of the younger generations are. 
So this report, Healthy People 2020, also went through some of this data. LGBT youth, so they are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide than non-LGBT youth. Do we have any behavioral health BHCs in here? No? Do you, get, do you have some here? You guys do, right? <laughs> do we still do that at Mount Park? <laughs> okay. Um, they're more likely to be homeless, 20 to 40 percent of homeless youth. So if you went to Phoenix and said, okay, every homeless youth, up to 40 percent of those homeless kids will be LGBT, which is kind of hard to believe, but it's true. Uh, the risk of HIV and STDs among that patient or that population of LGBT youth has to be, uh, is, is higher. Um, MSM, which stands for men who have sex with men, are at higher risk of HIV STDs, especially among communities of color. We won't go into that too much, in our, um, but in the South, it's almost a you know, health crisis. The rate of HIV in the Deep South among communities of color is going up. Uh, LGBT populations have the highest rate of tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use. Any idea why that might be? Self-medicating? Yes, yeah, so self-medicating like depression, sure. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a historian, but if you look at the LGBT community back in maybe 50 years ago, where would they typically gather to be bars. in safe areas? Bars. bars. What happens in bars? All of that. <laughs> Drinking, out, uh, smoking. Um, so it, that, that's, that's the main reason. Um, LGBT, um, lesbians are less likely to get preventative screenings for cancer, so less likely to get pap smears and mammograms. Transgender people experience a high prevalence of HIV and STDs, victimization, mental health issues, and suicide, and they're also much less likely to have health insurance than heterosexual or even LGBT <coughs> people. And then, like I mentioned, elderly LGBT people face additional barriers to health because of isolation, fewer family supports, and a lack of social and societal supports and services. So we're going to focus mostly on transgender, the term transgender, and who are transgender people, and how, as a health uh, care setting, you all can be, do better. Um, we all can do better at learning uh, how to take care, uh, care of transgender people. So that's an umbrella term. Um, and underneath the umbrella term transgender, uh, there can be other terms. The first one uh, that we'll, we'll look at um, is, well, let, let's start right here, uh, alternate, alternate, alternate terminology. So tr some transgender people um, prefer to be referred to differently. Right? And as a patient, as a healthcare center, our job is to help know how would you best like to be referred as? What, what, what's your preferred name? And preferred pronoun uh, sometimes, and we'll kind of get into that. But so a transgender woman, just for clarification, or a trans woman, um, is someone whose sex assigned at birth was male, but whose gender is female. And you might see that term MTF, male to female. Uh, so a transgender man would be just the corollary of that. The sex assigned at birth was female, um, but their in internal sense of their gender is male. And so sometimes, just to clarify, especially in health centers, we may say, oh, that's a male to female transgender person. Um, but some transgender people don't ever, never consider themselves that sex assigned at birth. So hearing someone say, oh, well, you're a transgender male to female might be you know, triggering for them or might be, that, that might not sit well with them. So in, in, I think it's just good to be aware of those sensitivities. And I think that the common term we would use would be a transgender woman. But internally, you might, you might have to say, okay, that's transgender woman, sex assigned at birth was a male, but uh, gender is, is female. And then there's, this is kind of more of a non, uh, or an umbrella term too now, which is a non-binary or a gender queer. Uh, term. So gender identity is increasingly described as being on a spectrum and maybe being fluid for some people. Um, anyone have any comments about that or have heard that term before, genderqueer and non-binary? Yeah, so a lot of you. 
Yeah. Anyone have friends or people they know that, that yeah, okay. You have a patient? Yeah. So um, these terms you just need to be familiar with. And, and, and that's why I think when they fill out the SOGI questionnaire, there is an option to select none of these, right? And that would be a good chance for providers to say, okay, you check none on here, tell me a little bit more. Do you mind talking about that? Okay, this is just a quick little survey. Um, by show of hands, how many of you, when you were a patient, or, or that you are a patient, how many of you have ever been asked by your health care provider or clinic, um, your history of sexual health, your sexual orientation, or your gender identity? Just by show of hands, if you've been asked this before. Okay, so maybe like a third to a half. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. The, um, I think, I think the, those who are younger have been asked that more because I think we're doing better as uh, healthcare providers and asking those questions that are important. So um, part of the first step in even taking better care of LGBT people are realizing where they are and who they are in our midst. And I have to hand it to Asen and Mountain Park, who's done just an amazing job of making that a priority of just collecting the data so we know who they are and how to better take care of them. Um, and those SOGI questionnaires that every patient fills out, that's just invaluable information. And I think uh, you guys should feel proud to work here because that's a, that's a big step that not everyone is doing yet, even though it's been recommended 10 years ago to start doing that. And then as providers, how often do you talk with your patients about their sexual history, their sexual orientation, or gender identity? Um, I always found that definitely the easiest to do at the very first visit with a new patient because you're asking all kinds of questions at that first visit. Everything. Um, so that to, to me seems like the most common place to ask that. But if you're a new provider coming to a new clinic maybe and the patient's been coming here for five years, that patient's new to you. So you should go through those questions again um, because they're a new patient to you. So we'll talk about LGBT youth for a minute. So family rejection and acceptance. LGBT youth rejected by their parents are more likely to attempt suicide, report depression, use illegal drugs, and have unprotected sex than those who feel that don't feel rejected. Probably makes sense to everybody, right? when you feel rejected by your own. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, yeah, <laughs> when you feel rejected by, I think, your own family, that's when that's that, that if, if that if there's not no acceptance there, it can be pretty hard for people to fill hope. And I've seen far too many situations like this. I think that's kind of why it's close to my heart. Um, a lot of situations like this that I've been a part of that's really painful to see. So parents might not even realize what rejecting behaviors are, but it's forbidding their kids to interact with their LGBT peers. It's blaming the child for being a victim of bullying, that it was their fault you provoke this by the way you act and by the way you dress, or hide, uh, hiding a child's sexual identity from other family members and friends, or worst case scenario, kicking them out of the house. Um, so what to do? And I think you'll be on the front line of this. I know I saw a number of LGBT youth and their parents um, when I was at Mountain Park, and there are resources to give those parents. I mean, I, I remember a case a couple of years ago, I had kind of a middle-aged mom in her, probably her 40s, who just was not herself, and she was depressed, and she thought it was her thyroid, and she wanted all these uh, tests done, and um, we kind of dug a little deeper and did some depression screening and found out she was very depressed, and she finally told us that um, she just found out her teenage son was gay, and she hadn't told a soul. She hadn't even talked to him about it. And she was just kind of living with this turmoil, not knowing what to do. 
And so fortunately, there's really good resources out here. So this resource, if I think all of your behavioral health um, consultants should have it, and I'm sure they probably do, but it's called the Family Acceptance Project. So what that is, is it's actually evidence-based studies that, sh that show the numbers, like the percentages of what may happen to your child or what they may experience if you don't learn how to be accepting and understanding. So what that study found was that LGBT young adults who reported high levels of rejection, which we just talked about, <coughs> were eight times more likely to have attempted suicide than their peers six times more likely to report high levels of depression, three and a half times more likely to use drugs, and three and a half times more likely to engage in unprotected sexual intercourse compared with um, their LGBT peers who had reject, er, non-rejecting families. They're, you know, they're so this is, I think, um, kind of a graphic that can help a parent see Look, the way you treat and respond to this is a matter of life and death. This is not just about, um, this is about, you know, life and death. So just going back real quick, this, uh, this family acceptance project, this is a free download. It's for healthcare providers, for mental health providers. It's a pamphlet. It's in Spanish. I think it's in Chinese. It comes from San Francisco State University. Um, and highly, highly uh, recommend that being part of what's used in terms of helping family members and LGBT youth work through this. Dr. Dr. Mayor, yes. So, um, I know we have some local organizations in, in the Valley that help uh, in terms of those family supports, and so you see, you know, that LGBT youth is eight times more likely to have attempted suicide or 40. 40% of youth are, homeless youth are eligible, right? Right. right. It's super important to think about where the local resources and supports are. You know, when you, when we identify a patient that has a need for that. So I know there are organizations like uh, P Flag or One in Ten. Yep. But I'm interested if people in the room know if other organizations or other resources or are using them or referring patients in that direction. So I guess I'm Those. No, that's great. Any, anyone have any other resources you're aware of? So those were the two I was going to mention, 1 in 10 and P flag. The, no, it's, it's, not in the, it's not in the talk. I'm glad you mentioned it. Yeah, because it's important to bring it down to a, a, a level that's here in, here in the valley. Um, I'm, I'm, a part of a, I'm a part of a group similar to P flag that's more for um, religious families who end up having some real conflicts with this. And, you know, I think you can all imagine why those may be some of the hardest situations. Um, that has conferences and parent meetings for those who have a religious type uh, background. Because um, sometimes a, a, a family who's very religious may not feel comfortable or safe at PFLAG, you know, or at one in 10 for their, for their youth. And so sometimes a safer place like that um, there are local organizations. Uh, does anyone know Deborah Peavy? Mm -hmm. You know her, Matt? I can't remember who she I think she's with HRC locally, but she works with uh, in the similar type of settings. There's, yeah, there's one community. Yeah, one community. Yeah, that, that's who she, that's right. <clears throat> one community is actually a local uh, resource, and we've signed their yeah, community the pledge. The so it's basically a way to reach out to business partners and and the community to say, hey, let's, let's come together on this and let's, let's be uh, focused on this as a community. So, if you think of anything else, you guys could uh, speak up or, or give it to a, a, any other groups that you know of. Sometimes it's like small grassroots people who just get together and kind of starts that way. Uh, so <laughs> this was a kind of a brochure. I think this was from Chicago. But it's basically... Um, you know, a way for, to validate the, the efforts that parents are making, kind of like we started off, that assume the best intentions. You know, this was kind of meeting the dad. I know he's, uh, we're meeting the dad halfway. I know he is gay and I don't under, always understand, but that doesn't change my love for him. 
So the clinical care of transgender people requires knowledge of gender identity and sex assigned at birth, right? And I can't remember, what, did, I, did, I, did we do like a SOGI talk here? Yes. Maybe like yes. nine months ago or so? Okay, I thought we did. So some of this for clinicians, you guys have already seen this. But um, obviously, I'll, I'll give you a couple of clinical cases why it's important. Whoops. Why it's important for providers to know the sex assigned at birth and their gender identity. So th these, are, these are real cases. Jake is a 45-year-old man who came in with pain and on x-ray what appeared to be metastasis, which is the spreading of cancer from an unknown primary cancer. Evaluation ultimately showed that he had developed cancer in his residual breast tissue after surgery to remove his breasts. So he had uh, top surgery a transgender man who had top surgery, and he was never told that he needed routine breast cancer screening even though his mother and sister also had breast cancer. So there is residual tissue, there is screening that should be the same as if he had uh, never had that surgery. And so that's why SOGI questionnaires are important, right? What was your sex assigned at birth and what's your gender? Um, this is another case, keep going the wrong way, sorry. Uh, this is a 59-year-old woman who developed a high fever and chills after head and neck surgery. And the source of the infection was her prostate gland, acute prostatitis. But no one knew that she still had a prostate, or that she even had a prostate gland. She was a transgender woman and that wasn't documented anywhere. No one asked her about her gender identity or knew she was transgender at all. So uh, quality preventive care, I already mentioned that lesbian women are less likely to get pap smears and mammograms. Um, studies have found, oh, we already went through that. But the rates of cervical cancer among lesbian women versus heterosexual women is the same. Right? So you get the same test because the incidence is the same. A uh, recent study indicates that lesbian bisexual women over 40 are much like, less likely to have their mammograms. And there should be some type of educational programs that we do either locally or globally to help lesbian women. You still have to have a mammogram. Even if you've never had sex with a male, you still have to have cervical cancer screening. This, that doesn't change. Um, because it is very common for a lesbian patients to say, I don't need that. No, I'm not going to do that. I don't need that. It's not. Uh, we need to do better at that. So the majority of transgender men do not undergo complete sex reassignment surgery and still retain a cervix if a total hysterectomy is, is, is not performed. So that's why you still need to do these tests. Transgender men with a cervix should follow the same screening guidelines as natal females. So a pap test can be very difficult for a transgender man to, a man to even consider doing, especially if it's someone who you know, trans, transitioned years ago. Uh, but it still needs to be done, and so I, I've never done one, uh, a pap smear on a transgender man. Uh, have you? And how was the experience? He was, he was okay. He was okay. It was a little difficult, but I, I did do it, and he let me, and he understood the reason. Good. And so it was just weird for me because he looked like a man. And he had the beard, he had the balding spot. If you look at him, and you mm -hmm. would not know he was a woman. Right. So it's kind of a little, like... Okay. Right. <coughs> you know. Did you recommend it or did I he did. come in asking for it? No, I recommended it. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. Yes? Yeah, I, I have two. I would say the process is a little bit different. You treat it a little bit like you would a geriatric woman because the tissue is atrophied a little bit. Sure. So you have to be more gentle in that way. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, if they're on, if they're on testosterone yeah. and they have no estrogen anymore, yeah, you're going to have real kind of friable um, tissue that's different. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Keep going the wrong way. Uh, let's see. So creating a welcoming and inclusive environment for caring, uh, working, and learning. I think uh, Mount Parks does as good as anyone on that. I mean, the fact that we're having this talk, the fact that you're all here, the fact that the SOGI's been in the works for a few years and it's actually happening here. Uh, but everyone can get better, right? So does your center have a non-discrimination policy that includes sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression? Yep. Are clinicians and staff taught about the health needs of LGBT people? <coughs> Do LGBT, uh, LGBT employees feel respected and safe at work? 
So that might be a little different. I mean, depending on where you're, maybe what site you're at, or yeah. I think I think weren't there surveys, yeah, the so employee you know, surveys on that? Yeah. Yep. And do the forms reflect the full range of sexual and gender identity and expression? Yes. yes. Yep. You guys, it's like I said, I think Mountain Park is ahead of the game. So another important thing is to add affirming marketing materials or affirming um, visuals and pictures and you know, uh, waiting rooms or flyers or mailers that show um, that this is an accepting and affirming place. And this goes to the providers. You remember back in the day that don't ask, don't tell? The, so this is, this, is a, this is a flyer created, I can't remember, some health center, I think in the south. And it was on the wall, it was out in the waiting room, which is do ask, do tell. You know, giving patients permission and knowing that they're in a safe place where this is part of their health needs and we want to know and be, uh, be there for, the, for that. So the challenge is to have quality health care for all people, including LGBT people, and we've kind of outlined why they're not getting the same type of health outcomes and how we can help uh, address those issues. So, um, you know, I'm not going to go through a list of action items, but hopefully you're kind of thinking in your mind, okay, maybe I need to do this a little bit different when I'm taking care of an LGBT person, or maybe I can uh, be a little more thoughtful this way. Um, let me just, we got like 10 minutes. The, I think the, the greatest, and so this isn't just my opinion, but this comes from Dr. Macadon, Harvey Macadon, who is the medical director at the Fenway Institute. So that's out in Boston, and th this is a center that just, all they do is educate hospitals and clinics on giving better LGBT health. He's a physician, so he kind of is at the front line of hearing um, the good and also the pitfalls that are happening. And from what he says in my personal experience, one of the um, common mistakes or uh, errors we can make with transgender people is simply knowing what name they want to be called. That you know, that's, goes a long way when the clerk up front refers to them by their preferred name and their preferred uh, pronoun if that's necessary. And that also can go a long way if it's not done right to lead to a very, very poor experience. So, um, you know, those who are front desk and kind of uh, MAs, those are things that if you're not quite sure how to address somebody, you know, maybe, maybe ask someone next to you or a supervisor, um, you know, how, how can I best address this person? I want to be respectful and I want them to feel like this is a place where uh, we're, we understand them and where they feel like they're themselves. So those are typically the stories you hear of a transgender man being called ma'am, or a transgender woman you know, being called sir, uh, that lead to not good situations. So. Any other comments on that? Yes? Um, one of the best advice I've ever gotten was from a friend who's, who's a trans woman, and she says, like every trans person is in a different stage in their transition. Some folks are barely starting, some people are transitioning, some people like, are you know, more of an advanced. Um, a good like rule of thumb is just to kind of just look at folks and just kind of. I mean, you always ask, right? Always, always ask. But if you're not able or able to ask for whatever reason, just kind of put yourself in their shoes and kind of see what is the gender that they're trying to put, to, to to express, right? Like just kind of like and then do your best to that way and um, just like put yourself in their shoes and try to see how how you think they're trying to convey to you. And so that's always a good a good way to. to uh, navigate that, or but also like always asking. I think most folks would like they'd love it when you ask right. respectfully. Right, right, absolutely. Yep. I think most assume uh, most assume best intentions, right? I think most humans assume that we're all trying to do our best, and just asking those simple questions. What's your preferred name? I need to document that in the chart. We do that for every patient. You know, very non-threatening questions like that. Uh, but that's a good point. So. Um, I also heard this saying that if you've met one LGBT person, you've met one LGBT person, right? Yeah, this is general stuff. This is not specific. 
and every person is on a, a, a you know would may, may may feel differently. These are just general uh, terms. But in general, the majority of transgender people do not have a sex reassignment surgery. I mean, it's actually pretty small, the percent that do have a sex reassignment surgery. Um, you notice I didn't use the term sex change. That's not a term we use in the medical community. It's, it's, it's a term that actually can, again, be triggering to transgender people. Because they've always felt this way. I'm not changing anything. You know, I've always felt this way. So. You know, th knowing those appropriate terms. Um, uh, again, some some have kind of a hybrid between uh, in terms of surgical procedures. A transgender man may have like a top surgery where they have a mastectomy. Um, so there's variations and there's starts and finishes and fluids fluid fluidity in between that we just as providers and as healthcare staff need to be sensitive to all those. Make no assumptions. Um, be kind. I mean. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Hassan. I'm just interested in, in your uh, experience because I know um, you saw a lot of, you had a lot of LGBT patients on your panel and I believe some trans uh, patients as well. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that we know kind of in general that when, you know, we've, we've the history of Mountain Park has really uh, grown and expanded based on word of mouth and, and people Refer other folks that they know, family and friends, to medical providers that they trust and that they feel comfortable referring to. Right, so right, I definitely. Think, um, as we get better at these things, uh, we'll see more patients that identify because um, hopefully they'll feel, feel more comfortable coming to Mountain Park. Yes. I was wondering about your experience yes. uh, here at Mountain Park and if you saw that and um, kind of what you picked up along the way in terms of how to better adapt care for. <clears throat> This particular group of patients that we see that you didn't mention already. I mean, yeah, no, I that I think that's that if if you ask your friend where they go to the doctor because you relate to that friend a lot, you'll naturally probably you know feel comfortable where they felt comfortable. I think that's even more true in the LGBT community, where people can feel like okay, um, I definitely don't want to walk into a place where the person I'm seeing potentially can be really unfriendly to, 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 to my community, right? I mean, that could be a very tra uh, traumatizing experience. Um, I've asked my brother this. I've asked a lot of other patients who live in the area. And there's, yeah, I think there's places and doctors who are very LGBT friendly and actually may have kind of the majority of their patients may be LGBT. Uh, and that's because I think of that care that they give and the word of mouth, just like any other doctor, when you're a good doctor and you're sensitive to someone's <coughs> needs. So, and I found that at Maryville when I was there. I had a number of patients that came because they were referred either by, you know, maybe their transgender friend or someone that they, they knew that was gay. And I think you just, that stuff doesn't happen overnight. You know, if this is something that you definitely are interested in as a provider or as a clinic, you definitely, it's going to take time, but it's, it should be, Mountain Park should be a place definitely that's on that map of LGBT friendly facilities. Yes? I also, in my experience um, in finding, I'm a referral coordinator, so seeking out resources like the endocrinologists and stuff like that. Yeah. I found that, the, the, not the opposite, but um, there were issues of me actually seeking out these resources because of people not knowing who I was. Once I started finding out that you know, I was with Mountain Park and stuff like that, there were some doors opening up, but there's a, there's a lot of um, resistance of being forthcoming with all the resources that they do provide. And I know that's based on security and whatnot, but um, I, I know that uh, you have to really kind of, in order to find the proper resources, you really have to kind of probe when you're running into this mm -hmm. uh, genre of question. Yeah. Absolutely. I, and I think local resources like one community, um, maybe one in ten, but probably more one community. I think at one point they did have a kind of a compendium of, of referrals in the valley of people who, you know, if they're doing hormone therapy, where to send them. Um, yeah, because that's, that's tricky, isn't it, to so find, the, find the place that will do that. Um, the, other th the, the flip side of that's also true. I think if you hear of a referral of a specialist that did not give good care and that was, wasn't accepting or wasn't 
you know, following the, the mission that you have here at Mountain Park, I think people need to know about that. You know, that needs to be reported back. We don't want to continue using specialists who may, um, you know, be completely against your mission, right? Any other questions or comments? Did we hit everything that we're supposed to hit? I can't, is there more? Okay, thank you very much.